But I'd like to start today with Psalm 125. Psalm 125. It's a song of ascents. The song of ascents were sung by Jerusalem, by the Jews as they went up into Jerusalem. Jerusalem is set up on a hill. And so from the lower part up to the the, the city, they sang songs as they were going to worship. And this is one of the songs of the ascents. There's a lot of those between Psalm 120 and Psalm 130. So they're short songs. And so we'll start with Psalm 125 today. The word of the Lord. Those who trust in the Lord are as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. From this time forth and forever, for the scepter of wickedness shall not rest upon the land of the righteous, that the righteous may not put forth their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. But as far as those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead them away with the doers of iniquity. Peace be upon Israel. Let us pray. Lord God, we do thank you for being able to come here, being here in good health, being here with sound mind, being here with an opportunity to raise your name up in this place. So many places around the world, Lord, they cannot do that for fear, fear of death, fear of reprisal, fear of great harm, fear of persecution. But here, Lord, we can still do that, and we thank you for that. We do not take that for granted, Lord. We invite you in. Come into our presence, your house, where you can hear us speak of your word, to teach your word, to proclaim your name, to sing songs of praise to you. You are so worthy of praise, Lord. You are worthy of our love. You are worthy of our devotion. You have called us to be people of praise. And we do, along with the psalmist, ask, do good to those Lord, who do good for you. Care for your people. Meet us today in this hour. Those of us who have needs, meet us here. Meet those needs. Those of us who have doubt, meet us here, Lord, and bring clarity to doubt. Take away fear. Take away anxiety. Take away nervousness. Take away all of the things that would keep us from having a hope and a joy in you, Lord. Let it be a day of refreshing, a day of resuscitation, a day of refreshment. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for meeting us here today. Enjoy the praise of your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The reading of the word today is from... John chapter 11. John chapter 11, starting in verse 46. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But a certain one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. Now this he did not say on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but that he might also gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. 
Jesus, therefore, no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim. And there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up to Jerusalem out of the country before the Passover to purify themselves. Therefore they were seeking for Jesus, and were saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priest and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they would seize him. And Lord, we do thank you for your word presented for us today, and we pray for its exposition, its application to us, that we would know what the Spirit intended in this passage, that we may understand it and apply it to our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, last week we talked about what I said was the greatest miracle of Jesus on the earth, raising of Lazarus from the dead. No doubt that caused a stir in the area. If you remember, they were in Bethany, where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived, some two miles to the east of Jerusalem. It was close by, and there were a lot of Jews that were there. We talked last week about how the Jews had professional mourners. They would come and mourn, and they would sit shiva seven days with somebody who had lost a loved one. And so there was a crowd around. Mary and Martha and Lazarus were fairly well off. And so they drew a crowd. And the funeral service was going just fine until Jesus showed up and said, There ain't no funeral here. He raises Lazarus from the dead. We looked at the reaction of some of the Jews to the end of that in verse 45. What John records in John eleven forty five. 45, Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary saw what Jesus had done and believed in him. It caused a stir. And some people who were maybe ambivalent about Jesus, hadn't made their mind up about him, decided to make a change and decided to believe in him, if not for his words, but his works. Who can raise somebody from the dead? Seriously, this guy's got to have a connection. He's got to have some power. Nobody can do that. Today we look at the reaction of the Jewish leaders. They make a final decision about Jesus' fate in that passage that I read earlier. And really it's an opportunity to look at who Jesus is. Decide about where you are with Jesus. These guys had all sorts of opportunities to decide who Jesus was. Who is this guy? It's a good time to evaluate. And at the end of John chapter 11, we see Jesus stepping out of public ministry, no longer walking anywhere with the Jews, because they're going to seize him the next opportunity they get. And so it's an evaluation point. You might even say it was their last chance. And so what do they say? That's the part of the conversation today. But we have to realize there's no second chance. We have to make a decision while we're here on the earth. There is no way station. There is no praying somebody out of purgatory, much to the chagrin of my Catholic friends. <laughs> it's here or nothing. Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. Last chance is your last breath here on earth. And so in the sermon notes outline, I've got a couple of things in here. One is considering Jesus. Considering Jesus. And that's the first couple of verses. Verse 46 and 47. Some of them went to the Pharisees. Some of the Jews who were there went to the Pharisees. And they told them what Jesus had done. The chief priest and the Pharisees convened a council. And we're saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. What are we doing? These guys who were there ministering to Mary and Martha, concerned about the family, they see Jesus raised from the dead. And what do they do? They run back to the Pharisees. It's like, you would not believe what we just saw. 
We saw something incredible. I've never seen anything like this before. Jesus raised a dude from the dead, man. Can you imagine the Pharisees getting this report? Not from one person, but from multiple people. And they have to consider, what are we going to do about this guy? They convene a council. The Pharisees come together with the chief priests, come together with the temple police, come together with the Sadducees. Everybody gets together. Think about the group that is here together. You have religious leaders. You have political leaders. You have the spiritual leaders, and then you have the business leaders. And everybody comes together. All these groups of people come together, figuring out what they're going to do about this guy, Jesus. I was struggling to think this week, what kind of an event would happen in our modern days that would bring all of these groups of people together that was so important to discuss? You're talking about maybe the Pope visiting the White House and bringing the, the whole economic advisor panel for the President of the United States. we got to figure out what's going on. The World Economic Council shows up at the White House to meet with the President and the Pope. This is a major deal for all these groups of people to come in. We've really got to figure out what we're going to do. This is an existential crisis for us, a world crisis for us. And so they're really concerned about having an answer like this. And they say, what are we doing? This man is performing many signs. This guy is dangerous. The topic of conversation is Jesus. The Romans were very much allowing the Jews to run Jerusalem. They were open to allow the Jews to run Jerusalem. Just don't cause any trouble. Just don't cause a stir. Just don't do anything that might get back to the emperor where I'm going to look bad. And so the leadership from the Romans was fairly lax unless there was a stir. And you know what? Jesus caused a little bit of a stir. Can you imagine the conversation going on in Jerusalem after this raising of Lazarus event? The murmuring that was there. The, the story as it went out farther and farther into public. It caused a stir. And they were concerned about that. And I put in the, the notes here. He is upsetting the world as they know it. Jesus has a tendency to do that, doesn't he? When he comes into your life, does he not upset the world as you know it? If you think back to the time when you first placed your faith in Jesus, was it a smooth event for you, like no trauma at all among your friends and family when you came to Christ? There are some that are that way. They grow up in the church. Their parents go to church. They're a child of the church. Maybe they were in the intra-womb in the church. And they have faith in Jesus, and it doesn't seem to cause any stir because that's all they know. I would say that would be the minority. Most people, when they come to Christ, Major change happens in their life, eh, Alice? <laughs> Major things happen. I remember being with a young kid when I was driving Uber to learn Jacksonville, and this young kid came into my car, and I said, where are we going? And he said, I'm gonna, I want you to take me over to my parents' house. And I said, yeah, what's going on? Well, we need to have a conversation, and they're not going to like it. Well, tell me what happened. He says, well, I gave my life to Jesus in a Baptist church on the west side of Jacksonville. All my friends left me. And I just feel the need. I got to go tell my parents because they're longstanding Catholics and they're probably not going to like what I'm going to tell them. That I'm not going to be part of the Catholic church anymore. I'm going to be part of a Baptist church. And he was a young guy. He was in his 20s and he was really concerned about what his the reaction is going to be from his parents. And I said, so how are your friends taking this decision? And he says, all my friends left me. Nobody wants to talk to me anymore because all I want to do is talk about Jesus and they don't want to hear that. <laughs> Coming to Jesus kind of changes your life. It upsets your apple cart. It upset the world. And that's what it did to the Pharisees. The status quo is no longer. It's no longer the same. And I put there, your desires are going to change when you come to Christ. Your friends are going to change when you come to Christ. 
Your understanding of family is going to change when you come to Christ. And that's by design. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, 34 to 36. Don't think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be members of his own household. By design, Jesus causes division. If you come to Christ, I guarantee it, somebody in your circle is not going to like it. They're not going to like it. It happened to me. Oh, geez, plumber became one of those goody two-shoes. I don't, don't know anybody in my life who thought I would be a goody two-shoes. <laughs> but the reaction was, ah, oh, this is a phase. He'll get over it. It's just like a sickness. That was 30-some years ago. I guess it didn't get over it, and it wasn't a sickness. <laughs> when he changes your life, he changes everything about your life. But he is a dividing force. That's what Jesus says. I'm going to turn a man against his father and a daughter against her mother. He divides. He provides conflict. Why is that? Because when you choose Christ, everything else takes a back seat. If you really choose Christ, everything else takes a back seat. And that's what Jesus said. I need to be the preeminent focus of your life. And I put in the notes, you may lose family members over this. Anybody make a decision for Christ and lose a family member? Where somebody said, I don't want to deal with you anymore? Or the family reunion, yeah, I'll show up, but they stay far away from you? Or somebody overtly looked right at you and said, I don't have anything to do with you if you're one of those guys. He divides. Luke eleven twenty three. He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. It is Jesus or everything else in your life. You're either with him or you're against him. You either work for him or you work against him. There's no dividing point from that. You can't put anything relative in there. It is absolute. He didn't give any options. It's that simple. Do you work for Jesus? Do you work for him? Or do you work against him? A great question. The Apostle Paul, in his life, Acts 9, we see his conversion. Verses 1 to 5. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priests, asked for letters from the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found anybody belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. The guy asked for a warrant to go after everybody who believed in Jesus. Was, was Saul working for Jesus or against him? He's working against him. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and a bright light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you working against me? Paul said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus who you are persecuting. You're working against me. But the change happened in Paul's life at that point in time. And when he writes to the Philippians a number of years later, chapter 3, verses 4 to 6, he says, If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. I've been circumcised on the eighth day. I'm of the nation of Israel. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee. I've got all the credentials, man. I've got a lot more credentials than you guys have. But there's one thing else he adds to that. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. So passionate was he to follow God that he persecuted the church, thinking that the church was against the Father. And he found out differently. And therefore, he was given righteousness and found blameless. And that's what he says to the Philippians. While he's sitting in jail and writes those letters, 
he has the joy of saying, I was against him, but now I am for him. What a joy is that, to be able to say that. And so these Pharisees have to deal with Jesus. Paul had to deal with Jesus. We have to deal with Jesus. The Pharisees have to deal with Jesus. Your friends and family have to deal with Jesus. Your co-workers have to deal with Jesus. It's the only question that needs to be answered on the earth that's important, really. What is your eternal destination? What do you do with Jesus? I tell you, prison ministry is a lot of fun. I did it for about eight years. Don probably knows. He's probably seen that happen over where he works and stuff. When you go in there, I love to get a group of people around. And my question is, what do you do with Jesus? That's the opening start. Where are you at with him? And you, somebody will stand up and somebody will say, oh, yeah, well, I went to church for a while. And somebody will say, ah, that's a bunch of hooey. There's no, nothing about that. I don't know why you waste your time. I'm not even going to listen to you. If I wasn't forced to be, in, be here and listen to you, I would go back into my cell. It's one way or the other. Some people want to hear. Some people want to run as far away as possible. Jesus divides. And to these Pharisees and these Jews and the high priests and the council, they have to ask the question, what do we do with Jesus? What are we going to do with this guy? He's doing all these miracles. What does that tell us? He was God in the flesh. Only God could do those miracles. Where is Jesus in your life? Where is God in your life? And so there are two options for that, if you look at the notes. Jesus is either a stumbling stone for you to fall over, or he's the cornerstone of your life. You're either going to fall by him, or you're going to embrace him as the cornerstone. What do you think these Jews were going to do? John eleven forty eight. 48, if we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. If we don't stop him, all men will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. The dude's causing such a stir. We've got to put a stop to this. Otherwise, we're going to get into great harm here. What will this do to us? We're going to lose our place in leadership. The Romans are going to say, you can't run this city anymore. You've got problems. They're going to take control of the city. They're going to take us out of our high positions. And they're going to cast us to the side. And they're going to bring their military leadership into the town like they did in Philippi, which was a military town. They're going to do the same thing in Jerusalem. We've got, we got to stop this problem. Don't the people know what we're at risk about? If we can't keep order, we're out. It's an interesting question. How many of you have heard this before? I would come to Jesus, but. I would accept him as Lord and Savior, but. What follows the but? <laughs> what comes after that? Whatever excuse comes after that. <laughs> Something may be good after that. Remember a guy telling me once, I would come to Jesus, but I would lose my family. I'm like, why would you lose your family? They hate God. So you're going to let your family dictate what you do for all eternity. <laughs> I would come to Jesus, but I don't want to give up my Sunday mornings to come to church. I would come to Jesus, but I don't want to give up my cigarettes, give up my alcohol, give up my Mary Jean. I'd come to Jesus, but my parents won't like it. My kids would hate me. Whatever the excuse is, these guys, their excuse was, I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my position. And so we have to evaluate what that means. What did Jesus say after that passage when he was talking about his father, father against son and mother against daughter versus 37 and 39 in Matthew 10. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. 
He who has found his life will lose it. He who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Whatever excuse after the but, I would come to Jesus' but. Jesus says, makes you unworthy. You put anything in there, makes you unworthy of him. He's pretty clear. Placing anything in the way of a relationship with him shows him no devotion. And Jesus wants your devotion. He wants your love. He wants your care. Does he deserve your love? Does he deserve your love? <laughs> he died on the cross, right? Greater love hath no man than this, than a man would lay down his life for his friends. He deserves your love. He deserves your devotion. And anything that happens after that but statement shows less than devotion to him. I put this in the notes, which is, I see this a lot. The adversary will use anyone on his team to distract you for what God wants to do in your life. You know, Satan's got his team too, right? Jesus has his team and Satan has his team. This is, I see this a lot in families. One person comes to Christ out of the family, wants to come to church. What happens to the rest of the family? All these objections start coming up. Yeah, but we got to go over that. We got to do this. Well, I've got somebody coming over to the house on Sunday. Yeah, but we really need to deal with this other issue. We need to really have a talk about our, about our child or about our, our in-laws or about our parents. They'll do whatever they can to distract you from the focus of coming to church and responding to God's call. Oh, I want to go over and be with the church and do some fellowship, you know, on Wednesday night. Well, no, 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 no. I've invited some people over for dinner. They'll try to distract you. They'll try to keep you away from the church. Things will come up. This is a war. <laughs> Satan wants to keep you from doing what Jesus wants you to do. He will throw any weapon he can at you in order to distract you from that. And he uses family very, very well because some of our family is, are on his team. I've seen that before in my own life trying to distract me. I remember when Kat and I first said we were going to come to Cambridge. You think that was a smooth conversation to our family? I remember Kat telling me this story. She said one of our kids said, I don't know that I could do that. I don't know that I could leave your family for the call of God. Are you really going to do that? And they stopped talking to her for like three weeks. You believe that? Amazing, isn't it? How the adversary will use some family members to try to distract you from what God wants you to, to do. I've seen it before with good people. My son wants to be a missionary. He's got a passion in his heart. He wants to go to the Middle East and be a missionary. You've got to help me, Pastor, talk him out of it. What? <laughs> God's got a call in his heart to be a missionary and you want to engage somebody who works directly for the God of the universe to convince him not to follow God. Why don't you just give me a loaded gun? <laughs> well, what are you going to do with that? If God's got a call on your heart, no way you're going to distract that. But here you got a good person who says, I don't want, I don't want my kid going off to, to do mission work out of the country because it's dangerous and I want to protect them and I want to have them in my life and they could be at risk. Well, if they work for God, my guess is God could probably take care of them, <laughs> protect them, right? That's a trust issue. But good people, no, 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 no. They try to get in the way of God's work. And here you got Caiaphas, the high priest. Whose team is he on? Is he on Jesus' team? Or is he on Satan's team? He's on Satan's team. The high priest of the Jews on the adversary's team, John 11, 49 and 50. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account. It's expedient for you that one man would die for the people, that the whole nation would not perish. 
God uses Caiaphas to prophesy about what Jesus is going to do. Do you think that God, Jesus, have the ability to shape those who are unbelievers in the world if he wants? Sure. He can even bring words out of their mouth. We learned that in Romans 9 in our Wednesday night Bible study. There were children of Israel were stuck in Egypt. And what did he do to Pharaoh? Hardened Pharaoh's heart. He wasn't going to let him go. He wasn't going to let him go. No matter what he did, he wasn't going to let him go. I don't care what you do to me. I don't care what plagues you send. I'm not going to let him go. God intentionally hardens Pharaoh's heart so that the rescue of Israel from Egypt becomes a defining moment in their life. You wouldn't have Passover without that. And so why does Jesus do those things? Why does God do those things? So that those who were chosen will be lovingly devoted to him for his rescue. And we see it again and again and again. We see it with Joseph, right, being sold into slavery. We see it again and again. God shapes the unbelievers for the purpose of the believers. And he does it here as well. And Caiaphas prophesies that Christ is going to die for the whole nation. Does that happen? Sure it does. So we call the message the prophetic killer. Caiaphas is the killer. He is the one who is going to take Jesus down. It's either him or me. We're going to kill this guy. And instead of recognizing him as Lord, they fall into the stumbling stone. They don't look for the cornerstone. They look for the stumbling stone. This has been prophesied, Psalm 118, 21 to 24. I shall give thanks to you, for you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected have become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Psalm 118, verses 21 to 24. The builders were going to reject Christ. Jesus quotes this psalm in Matthew 21, 42 to 46. He says to the Jews... Did you ever read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. And it's going to be given to somebody who will produce fruit in it. He's talking to the leaders. Verse 45 of that passage, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them, and then they sought to seize him. This guy is pointing his finger at us, prophetically saying that we were going to stumble over him. Peter quotes the psalm in one of his sermons before the council in Acts 4, 10 to 12. Let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel, but by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, God raised from the dead. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, which became the chief cornerstone. Isn't it interesting, again and again and again in Scripture, this is passage, this psalm is mentioned and so I put in the notes, if you're counting on anybody else for your trip to heaven, you better rethink your strategy. He's either the stumbling stone or the cornerstone of your life. There is no middle ground. There is no staying on the fence. Isaiah 8, 14, another great one. He will be as a sanctuary to some, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to others. He's either your sanctuary or he's your stumbling stone. Paul to the Corinthians. <laughs> we preach Christ crucified, 1 Corinthians 1, 22 to 24. To a Jews, a stumbling block. To the Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. He's going to cause people to stumble. Peter writes about that in his second epistle, 
1 Peter 2, 4 to 8, coming to him as a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. Have you not read in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. He who believes in him will not be disappointed. That was quoted in the Roman study on Wednesday night too. He is a stumbling stone and a rock of offense to people. How many of you ever thought about sharing Christ with somebody? You thought about opening your mouth, but then you said in your mind, I don't want to offend anybody. Anybody ever said that? I don't want to offend anybody. I'd, I'd talk to you about Christ. I'd talk to my family. I'd talk to my friends. I'd talk to my coworker, but I don't want to offend them. You probably offend them without opening your mouth if you believe in Jesus. <laughs> if you go to church, you're already an offense to them. <laughs> because the light of God shines from you out. <laughs> they guarantee they see it. You're different than they are. You love people. You care for people. That's different than most people. So you don't worry about offending him. You think Jesus was concerned about offending people? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He told the disciples this. You think the Jews liked that? That was an offense to him. What do you mean? I can't go to, G go to heaven just by being good? I've got to come through Jesus? How arrogant is he? Well, you know, that's a little offensive. <laughs> I've had people get offended by some of the things I've said. You got to be direct and tell the truth. So I put in the notes, when you talk about Jesus, you're guaranteed you're going to offend people. Get over it. <laughs> you're prophesied to offend people when you talk about Jesus. It's going to happen. <laughs> you are either with him or you stumble because of him. So what do you do with Jesus is the greatest question of our time. I've opened up conversations where I've just said that. What do you do with Jesus? Don't let him off the point. Oh, I think he's a good teacher. Okay? He's a good moral example. Okay? Do you believe in him and accept him in your life as the savior of the world? Oh, well, I wouldn't go that far. Well, then you're against him. He says he's the only way to get to heaven. Do you want to go to heaven? Well, not if it costs me that. It's sad sometimes. But you've got to ask the question. This is why Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 wrote this. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Think about that. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Knowing what God is going to do to those who are against him, we do whatever we can to persuade men. A little grandchild. No spiritual training whatsoever. Parents, no interest in talking about Jesus to them. Won't even allow the child to go to church. Even when we ask. Won't even allow him to come. Why won't you allow him to come? Well, I don't want to force anything on them. I want them to be able to make their own decision. I don't want to bias them in any way. You're biasing them by not allowing them to come to church, right? <laughs> you're already biasing them. You're either with them or you're against them. And then I got some people who say, you know what, I don't like it, but I'm going to let them come to church. Because they say, you know what, that's free child care. And that's what they think about it. I'm perfectly okay with that. I'll do free child care for you if I could talk to the kids about the Lord, man. <laughs> How many of you would pay a hundred bucks to tell somebody about Jesus? Just for the opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. Try that. Go hang out in McCook in front of a fast food restaurant. Somebody comes in there, say, can I buy you a meal? They'll look at you and go like, what do you want to buy me a meal for? I just want to buy you a meal if you just allow me to talk to you for a little bit. Free meal. There is a free lunch. I just want to talk to you about Jesus. We did that as a as an outreach in Jacksonville, it was very interesting results. Just hang out in front of a, front of a, re a restaurant, and you can talk about him. People did that. 
Some will fall over him, though. Some will, he'll be the stumbling block that they cannot get over. I remember trying to run hurdles for the first time. And I was a pretty tall guy. I thought I was in shape. That was only a four-foot hurdle, Jim. You know what it was to me? A stumbling block. <laughs> I face-planted. <laughs> I then realized the high jump is my goal for track because that thing is a lot higher, but there's a cushion <laughs> if you miss. <laughs> it was a stumbling block. <laughs> Some of us will run into hurdles from time to time, but with the Lord on our side, we get over the most important hurdle, which is what do you do with Jesus? He is my Lord and my Savior, the God of the universe. You're guaranteed a trip to heaven. So Jesus can be the cornerstone of our life as we go on in this passage, John eleven fifty one to 52. Now Caiaphas did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not for the nation only but in order that he might also gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. The death of Jesus allowed the cornerstone to show up. The cornerstone of what? The cornerstone of the church. Church with capital C. The church. Jesus became the cornerstone of the church through his sacrifice. He is the cornerstone. Isaiah prophesied that, Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes in him will not act hastily. Paul said in Ephesians 2, he was the foundation of the church. Jesus Christ being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. You know, we're building a house outside of town over there. I'm really interested to see how the cornerstone gets set up out there, right? Because I don't want my house going off kilter. Is it kind of important when you're doing a building to make sure that you've got a pretty good cornerstone where you have perpendicular lines in the corner. <laughs> they take great pride in those architectural diagrams. And when the builder comes in there, we pretty much hope that he stays with a cornerstone because I want a right angle. He's the right angle of the church. He's the one that sets the church into motion. He's the one who builds the church. That's what he told Peter in Matthew, right? I am the builder of the church. I will build my church and nothing will come against it. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3, No man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, Jesus Christ. No pastor, no preacher, nobody should come into a church thinking that they're the ones that run the church. They're the ones that own the church. They're the ones that decide what happens. Jesus runs the church. It's his church. And all of us have to agree that he runs the church. So is he a stumbling stone for you? Or is he your cornerstone of your life? That's an important question. It's the most important question. So to these leaders, which one was it? Was he going to be the cornerstone of their life, or was he going to be the stumbling stone for them to get crushed? They were on the wrong team. They're going to get crushed by him. And so I put in the notes, sayonara. <laughs> the leaders plan to kill him. And so Jesus retreats into the countryside with his disciples, verses 53 and 54. So from that day they plan together to kill him, and Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews. He went away from there to the country near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there he stayed with his disciples. No more public ministry. Now he is only going to minister to the disciples. Think about that. From this point on in the Gospel of John, you're going to see him anointed by Mary, for his burial in John chapter 12. 
And then if you go on in there, from the end of John 12, John 13, John 14, John 15, John 16, John 17, who's Jesus going to be talking to? He's pouring into the disciples. And in our future in this study, we are going to see all aspects of kingdom theology show up because he's given his disciples the training ground. Here's what you need to know. He first is going to tell them, I'm going away, and they're going to be on their own. But he's going to provide a help for them. I'm going to give you this person, this being, the Holy Spirit, and he's going to come into your life. And he's trying to prep his disciples for the future. But he's no longer going to be out in public anymore. His next public moment is going to be when he comes into Jerusalem on Passover week, fulfilling all of the prophecies that are talking about how he is going to come into the city. What was prophesied about him? He was going to be riding on what? He's going to be riding on a donkey. Everybody's going to say, Hosanna. That was prophesied as well. All the prophecies about the Messiah coming in are going to be put in place. And yet, these Jews still see him as a stumbling block. How do you miss those signals? How do you miss the fact that Jesus is the most important decision in your life? How do you put things of higher priority in your life than that? Family, work, friends, other activities... Parables that Jesus gave in the Gospels were very interesting. He said the kingdom was like a great treasure that was buried in a field. And somebody knew that the treasure was buried in the field. What did the person do? Sold everything else they had to get enough money to buy the field so they could have the treasure. Is that you? Are you willing to give everything else up for Jesus? Is he the most important part of your life? Only Jesus. Christ alone, cornerstone, we sang earlier. Unless he's the most important part of your life, you're at risk. You could be deluded into thinking that you're okay. And you may not be okay. And that's not only the people here in the sanctuary today, but the people who listen later on to the message. People will be deluded into thinking that they're, own, they're okay. Otherwise, Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23 don't need to be written, where many will say to him, Lord, Lord, did I not do all of these things for you? And Jesus will say, get out of here. I never knew you. People will be deluded. Don't let it be you. If he is the cornerstone of your life and he is preeminent in your life, relationship with him becomes the most important thing in your life. He becomes the focal point of every major decision. Every major decision that you make. Lord, what do you think about this? I'm thinking about getting married. Lord, what do you think about this? I'm thinking of having a kid. Lord, what do you think about this? I'm thinking about buying a, a vehicle, buying a house, moving a location, changing churches, all these other major decisions that you have in life. Lord, what do you think about this? Because I know, Lord, you have the, my best interest at, at heart, and I can trust in you. How many of us make decisions like that without even considering what the Lord has in mind? He needs to be the focal point of that. And so he's going to pour into the disciples for the next few weeks. And he is going to program them and give them everything that they need in order to be able to function as missionaries for him. You know what? He's done the same thing for us, right? He's given us everything that we need in order to be missionaries for him. 
how we treat the Bible. The place that it becomes in our life is indicative of our devotion to him. Be devoted to him. He will never let you down. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never be somebody who is untrustworthy in your life. If you're his, he will never reject you. Even if you fall, even if you fail, even if you make any mistake, even if you say something that you shouldn't do, even if you offend somebody that you shouldn't, he will never let you down. Trust in him. Make him the cornerstone of your life. Well, the last point in the notes, the APB is issued. It's really a programmatic thing. He knew it was going to happen. The council has decided, verses 55 to 57, the Passover of the Jews was near, and, he, and many went up to Jerusalem out of the country to purify themselves. Before Passover, you had to purify yourself. To be able to go into the temple, you had to purify yourself. There had to be rituals that were done to be allowed into the temple area. They're on their way up. A big crowd is coming. Jerusalem would swell three times the size of the city during the Passover. A whole lot of people will be there. And so the guys who were there, it says, they were seeking Jesus and were saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think? Is he going to show? Is he going to not come to the feast at all? And to the crowds, what did the chief priests say? The Pharisees have given order that if anyone knew where he was, he was going to report it so that they might seize him. Is it going to happen this time? They tried to seize Jesus several times. Are they going to seize him at the Passover? Not in the city. They're going to seize him in a garden. But before they seize him, before God allows himself to be taken... He is going to pour into the disciples. This doesn't matter if the APB was issued. You can't take God unless God wants you to be taken, wants himself to be taken. This is the third time Jesus is mentioned as a, at a Passover event by John. John 2.13 is one. John 6.4 is another. This is the third one. That's how we know that Jesus has three years of ministry on the earth. It's timed by the Passovers. What do we get from this message today? What do we learn from these guys, the high priest and the disciples? What do we know? One went one direction, one went another direction. You're either with him or you're against him. You either work for him or you don't work for him. These Jews worked against him. The disciples worked for him. They made that the choice to do that. They are the ones that stood up and say, he is the cornerstone of everything. They did not stumble. So I put... Where are you with Jesus? If you close your eyes with me and ask the question to the Lord, Lord, where am I with you? Let me know, where am I with you? Am I in a good place? Are you the cornerstone of my life? What do I need to change in my life to make you the cornerstone? Put thoughts in my mind right now, Lord. Let me know what, what needs to go away in my life for you to be the cornerstone. What attitude do I need to change? What forgiveness do I need to give others in order for you to be the cornerstone of my life? Who do I need to ask forgiveness from? What do I need to do for you to work for you? How do I need to be more committed to you? Lord, I pray for everybody in my hearing that they 
know you as the cornerstone of their life. I don't want anybody to stumble. I don't want anybody to be self-deceived. I don't want anybody to run into the judgment thinking that they're okay. Lord, make it patently obvious. Give us the assurance, Lord, that we are with you. Give us the determination to get there if we're not there right now. Give us the passion to say, Lord, save me if we're not in a right relationship with you. Lord, I thank you for all the people diligently listening to the message today. Lord, may they be safe and secure with you as the cornerstone of their life. Our last song today is a simple one. My Jesus, I love thee. May we sing that together as our devotion to you, Lord. May we be devoted to you. And may you receive great joy in hearing the praise of your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, this is Pastor Jeffrey Plummer. I want to thank you for watching our sermon video today. Our sermon video is available on our website, which is www.cbccne.org. On that website, you will find sermon video as well as a blog that I write each week to our fellowship here at the church. At the top of the website in the corner, you can see all of those links that can get to that information. You can also learn about our church with our church history in the About page to be able to find out what we're all about here in Cambridge, Nebraska. Again, I want to thank you for watching our sermon video today, and I pray that you have a blessed day.